but CES is so early this year that my ears are still ringing from all the champagne corks popping on New Year's Eve. So happy New Year. <laughs> yeah, it's early this year. Um, but hey, listen, uh, what, a, what a tradition this evening has become uh, for many of us. And uh, here at this presentation, uh, and at Unveiled in just a few minutes, uh, a great, great to see all of you just looking around the room. You know, I see so many familiar faces, uh, so many friends, just from all across the industry. So great to see you here. And importantly, on behalf of all of us, whether you're here with us in Las Vegas or you're watching online, uh, on behalf of all of us at CTA, Consumer Technology Association, the owner and producer of CES. I want to welcome you to CES 2023. You made it. Woo! You made it. So tonight I've got a lot of great technology trends to talk through that really, I think as you get out and about on the show floor, we'll really, you're, you're going to see a lot of these trends and, and run into these pretty much all over the place. But these are the key themes that I'll be talking through tonight with you. And I want to start with enterprise technology innovation because, one, you're going to see a lot of enterprise tech out on the show floor at CES 2023, and a lot of this technology is transformative to the global economy, which means it's really important. Uh, and not all these innovations come from the usual suspects like, like Panasonic, our big tech companies. A lot of this innovation comes from the smallest startups that we feature each and every year at Eureka Park over in the Venetian Hall. So it's really important to, to understand what's going on with enterprise technology innovation because again, a lot of this is transformative. And we know that technology is addressing uh, increasingly the world's greatest challenges. Uh, and certainly technology has a lot of answers for those challenges. And when we think about challenges and the industry and the economy, uh, certainly, there are manifold challenges, but I want to just talk through a few of those with you this evening, starting with supply chain. You know, and interestingly enough, not too long ago, we didn't talk a lot about supply chain, and nowadays, we, we talk a lot about supply chain, and the reasons are obvious, but quick update, I'm happy to say that container shipping costs are coming down, we're seeing less friction at ports around the world, but you really have only to look at what's happening right now in China to understand just how vulnerable supply chains remain. So supply chains remaining vulnerable. We also see demand for semiconductors starting to soften. And some of this is a natural process, folks, as, as demand for chips for everything powering the data centers right through to consumer uh, technology devices, as that demand comes down from pandemic highs. And honestly, this is a good news, bad news situation because on the one hand, with less demand, we're starting to see those lead times come down also as new facilities come online. But the bad news is, is that we're kind of moving from, from a chip shortage to potentially an oversupply in, in some cases. And potentially, Dr. Lisa Su of AMD in her keynote at CES may address some of these things. But the downside risk with oversupply is that might we see some of the, the latest chip architectures and other, other processors and logic chips and so forth be deferred as we work through some of this inventory. We'll have to find out. And whilst semiconductors are kind of a unique and intrinsic issue for the tech industry, labor is not. Now here's a profound statement for you. I think that 20 years ago, Technology was the nice to have when it comes to business or the commercial enterprise. Today, I think humans are the nice to have. Humans are the nice to have. The simple truth is we can't hire enough workers, certainly if we're talking about skilled labor and knowledge workers. And yes, I'm aware we, we, we've had some, some newsworthy and a lot of in the media reported tech layoffs and so forth like that. But across the global economy, across every economic sector, Businesses are struggling to find workers. Humans are the nice to have. And certainly technology has an answer, and we're gonna talk about that in this chapter of enterprise tech innovation. And really the unfortunate, but re reality uh, punchline of this slide is yes, inflation. And inflationary effects on the consumer wallet 
And we know that uh, the Fed here in the U.S. and more central banks around the world are con increasingly convinced that we're in this protracted battle with inflation and they're following a path of progressively tighter monetary policy, which is code for raising interest rates, which affects all of us, by the way, especially if you're buying a home or if you're carrying credit card debt, exactly uh, what I'm talking about. So we all feel that pain. But monetary policy is, is one way, frankly, a blunt instrument to remedy inflation. The other way is by boosting productivity. The other way is boosting productivity, which is why I'm reminded by the British economist Christopher Freeman and his observations. Uh, now, Freeman, if you remember, was a student of technology innovation and its impact on the economy. And as you can see here, Freeman observed that during these periods of economic downturn, innovation tends to accelerate and even bunch up. And as this innovation is unleashed, this is what levels up business opportunities, it levels up the economy, it levels up experiences for consumers as new products are launched and new services are deployed. So this is what Freeman is talking about. And, and the, the photo in black and white is a clue. Now, now, Freeman formulated his thesis back in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s. But fortunately, we don't have to look quite so far back in time to find evidence of exactly what Freeman was talking about. No. In fact, to look at this, we have only to look back to the last big economic downturn, the Great Recession. And a lot of us remember this in 2008 and 2009. Now, what we remember even more are the powerful new waves of technology innovation that Freeman was describing. And a lot of that was predicated with the arrival of the 4G LTE network, which brought us what? Mobile broadband. And all the things that we've been able to do with mobile broadband. And also remember, smartphones were still, even in 2010, a relatively new thing. Here in the United States, only about 30% of U.S. households at that time owned at least one smartphone. Probably the same was true in most developed countries. That's certainly not true today. Almost 100% uh, own a smartphone. So this powerful wave of technological change, we know about this because we lived it. But what about now? Well, in a recent poll by the Wall Street Journal, 60%, more than 60%, in fact, of surveyed economists believe that the U.S. will slip into a recession sometime this year. And it's been widely reported in the, the financial media that several countries around the world, some in Europe, for example, are already in recession. And this time, I think the powerful new waves of technological change that will really remedy inflation and, and restore growth, global GDP growth, uh, will, will really come from the enterprise side. From the enterprise side. That's why I want to talk about this. And once again, a lot of this innovation is going to be predicated or based on the wireless network, this time 5G, which is the clue that it's the fifth wireless generation, but actually 5G is the first wireless generation that will actually be led by enterprise innovation. 5G means faster mobile broadband for consumers, but for commercial industrial IoT applications, it's really the greater capacity and ultra-low latency that is going to unlock so much innovation, and we're going to see that across this decade, which is why I want to pull back for a minute and take a look at, at, roughly speaking, what we can expect from enterprise tech innovation across this decade. It's really in two phases. Two phases. One we've been living through and we're familiar with, which is digital transformation. Now, this was really born out of the health crisis over the past two to three years. We wrote a lot about digital transformation, the race to cloud, a lot of businesses having to pivot online, sometimes for new opportunities, sometimes for survival. And of course, a lot of these transformative endeavors are gonna continue, but I think because of what's happening, once again, with 5G, we're entering into a new season or a new phase of automation and virtualization. And this is where we're gonna see progressively more, more and more industrial IoT applications across the breadth of the economy. Watch and wait, it'll happen, and it starts here at CES 2023 with a lot of the incredible enterprise or commercial focused technologies that you're gonna be able to see and document for the delight of your readers. Things like smart factories, fully automated facilities, smart hospitals, automated farms, all of this is gonna happen this decade and into the 2030s, even more. And yes, 
a lot of this also will build in more capabilities and use case applications for Web3 endeavors, metaverse applications. Again, a lot of this is predicated on 5G, so therefore I think it's important to take a look at 5G and that development cycle and a lot of the work that is being done by 3GPP, the global standards body that really writes the protocols, standards, and requirements for 5G. And if you haven't looked into this, it's worth your time. Now, I can't talk through all the specific uh, protocols and so forth, there's not enough time for that. But suffice it to say, as you can see from the slide, 3GPP publishes their standards work in what's known as releases, most recently release 17. And this is essentially chapter one for, from a technological standards standpoint for a lot of the industrial IoT applications that I've been referencing. From here forward, the work is bracketed really, as you can see, as 5G advanced, 5G advanced. Now, what does that mean? Well, here we start to unlock even more capability from 5G, specifically around those two things that are important for commercial enterprise, capacity, data throughput, bandwidth, and then also latency, ultra low latency applications, anything that requires that, precision manufacturing, other automa uh, automotive uh, and automated different endeavors. But also in 5G advanced are a lot of protocols that are dedicated to XR applications, which points to advancing opportunities and capabilities and experiences in the metaverse. All this is coming and it's happening over the next several years and it's gonna be very exciting. And each year at CES, we will write a new chapter in a lot of this enterprise information that as the title of the previous slide said, is quite literally upgrading the global economy. Now, if 5G is the network layer of this decade, then the software stack on that for the commercial enterprise has to be this new set of digital utilities that, that we talk about, which are listed across the bottom of the slide for you. So cloud, AI, robotics, and cybersecurity, of course, all of this connected automation and virtualization has to be secured. But these are, are really, if I'll put it this way, if Microsoft Office is the toolkit of the modern knowledge worker, then these four technologies we describe as digital utilities, this is the new toolkit for the modern enterprise. What, I, what am I saying? I'm saying that more and more commercial enterprises across the globe, around the world, are gonna be employing cloud, AI, robotics, and be secured with cybersecurity robustly. You're gonna hear more and more and more about this, and that's why we say it really underpins and will eventually underpin the entire global economy by the time we get to the next decade. All this is happening now, and it's really exciting, and you can witness it at CES 2023. And to illustrate this point, not to labor the point, but to really illustrate this, I want to point to really the logistics sector and warehouse automation. And the benefits of what I've been describing, everything that I've been describing so far with these industrial IoT applications, the benefits are across the top speed. So considering fully automated facilities, like the, the warehouses that are architected and deployed by uh, companies like Okado Group, Safety, now we fully expect uh, a lot of human-machine partnerships to manifest in the commercial enterprise, certainly in a warehouse environment, humans working alongside robots. But also robotic assist devices, as shown here, the CrayX, which is a robotic assistive appliance that is worn, a different type of wearable. But when you think about the CrayX, which you can actually go see in West Hall, it makes that old Velcro back strap kind of look 2000 and late. You know, I want to wear something like this that's really going to give me a, a kind of a boost when I'm picking up that heavy crate or whatever it is. And I think the sum of speed and safety really is savings, or put another way, profitability. Certainly for uh, a lot of publicly traded companies and so forth that want to increase shareholder equity. That's why a lot of this is going to happen. This is another reason why a lot of this is going to happen. Safety, certainly, thinking about savings, lower insurance premiums, we're able to mitigate risk, let the, let the dangerous jobs be done by machines, and we'll, we'll give everybody a Cray X that they can wear so we don't have as many uh, you know, workers' comp claims. Things like this, it's, it's really interesting. This is just one example in one sector of the economy, and there's so many more. There's just not enough time to talk through them. Now let me close this chapter with a nod to cybersecurity and if you thought 
that cybersecurity is basically a firewall and your IT guy and your password keeper app on your phone, you're gravely mistaken. This slide says a lot. I mean, this is an industry all to itself. There's so much going on here to secure, and this is important work because, yeah, we want to secure our data, but we also want to do things like protect our children online. This is, very, this is a very serious business, and, but a lot of this is, is really approachable and we're experiencing even more and more in our daily lives. Take, for example, identity and access management. You know, we used to say trust but verify. Now we say zero trust. I don't trust you at all. So yes, I know I just logged in two or three minutes ago, but I'm, I'm obliged to provide my password again because the system doesn't trust that it's still me and I'm still behind beavering away at the keyboard. But zero trust is a great strategy for cybersecurity and online endeavors. I, I don't recommend using this with personal relationships. You don't want to be asking your spouse for their ID all the time. I don't recommend that. I don't recommend that. And that joke, by the way, usually gets more laughs. So, but I know a lot of you guys are jet lagged and so forth. So that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> All right, next. So this, you might think that this is a provocative statement, but yes, it's true that the metaverse is closer than you think, and CES 2023 is going to, I think, really bring that into sharp relief, and you're going to see a lot of evidence here. Now, of course, any dialogue these days around metaverse is very likely to be met with skepticism. And that's okay because we've seen no shortage of marketing spin, and, and then also we probably had debates with our friends and colleagues on what is metaverse and, and debates about definition. And so I do think it's true that metaverse as a term uh, is still a speculative one. It's still a metaverse is still a speculative term, but make no mistake, this is a real trend. Just as the internet was a real trend in the early 1990s, even though a lot of us didn't know what it was. I'm old enough to remember that, many of you are, but that's exactly the same dynamic that is manifesting around the metaverse right now. But here's what's important. Here's what's important. At CES 2023, we start to see legit substance forming around this trend of metaverse. What am I talking about? Well, two things, really. One is technology innovation, of course, at CES. But the other is business strategy. And that'll be illustrated in different use cases that you're gonna be able to, to check out and maybe even participate in through a demo at, at CES. Which is why I think it's better positioned metaverse is actually the metaverse of things. Because what we're learning about metaverse now, and you'll, you'll see this and witness this at CES, is that I think the hypothesis before was that metaverse meant these hyper-immersive shared experiences, something like Ready Player One. And that's actually turning out not to be true. In fact, there are degrees of immersion. But what Metaverse to me really is, is the next generation of the internet. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is an elevated, an online experience that has an elevated sense of immersion. We're all familiar with online shopping, two-dimensional, an image, maybe there's a chat box. There's a lot more that we can do. And here's what it's gonna look like. Really two modalities that you're gonna experience at CES 2023. And the first one is this, is virtualization. So what is virtualization? Well, this is Metaverse manifesting in essentially virtualized 3D interactive spaces that importantly are accessible with a laptop, tablet, or phone. So this is really Web3 and a much more compelling and interactive experience and has, an, again, an elevated sense of aversion a lot of digital twinning. This is consumer facing, many because a lot of people don't own VR headsets quite yet. Now, we know that will change in the coming years, but uh, also can be individualized. The second modality that you'll see here at CES is, of course, immersion. Immersion. And these, these tend to be more on the enterprise side for the reason I mentioned earlier. Not a lot of consumers own a VR headset yet, so a lot of enterprises are leveraging this technology that tends to be more fully immersive, a lot of digital twinning going on, simulation, a lot of collaboration, shared experiences, but in an enterprise context. So let's take a look at some of the innovation that we're gonna see at CES. I wanna start with, with virtualization and a company called Touchcast, which is part of the Microsoft exhibit over at West Hall. Now Touchcast is a new breed of, of service provider, if you like, Metaverse as a service, and I think Unity Technologies is another example of this, this emerging breed of, of service providers 
And in this case, TouchCast has this exact, this virtualized retail space, 3D interactive, but it has a live person, a one-on-one -on -one individualized experience. That's refreshing. That's an elevated sense of immersion, and it's certainly leveled up from online shopping today. I think you'd agree. And this has some great benefits, because whether we're shopping for a computer or a new pair of sneakers, the things that we can do in this virtualized 3D interactive environment are incredible. We can have a cutaway of the shoe to see exactly how this foam protects the runner's foot. Or we can look inside the machine and see exactly how things are working. And all this can be done from home. And for the salesperson's sake, the sales rep, it looks just like being on a Teams call. This is innovation, and this is starting to happen now, virtualized. Virtualization in the metaverse. What about immersion? This is where it starts to get really interesting. And a company you're going to want to check out is OVR, stands for Olfactory VR. They're over in Venetian. And yes, they have digitized sense. But this is not your father's smell of vision. This is deeply impactful, and the statistics around olfactory elements rendering for, the, for memory and sense of immersion speak for themselves. And as it turns out, this, our sense of smell is actually our, our, our primary sense, not, not sight or hearing, but our sense of smell. And obviously, it has a lot to do with our sense of taste. So it's our primal sense. And what you're going to see is, yeah, there are, there are entertainment applications, but a number of very long tail of therapeutic applications. So really advanced technology bringing in smell to these immersive experiences and emblematic of the kind of path that we're on, of deeper and deeper and deeper immersion as we move forward in time in this decade related to metaverse. But what about strategy? Well, again, I compare where we are with metaverse today with the early first days of the internet, and it's true. And I think right in the middle, the basic fundamental strategies of, of metaverse and whether, whether or not it's virtualized or fully immersive are the same and congruent with the internet today as we know it. These, these three key strategies of communication, collaboration, transaction. And as we push these one way or the other for the consumer or the enterprise, you can see how we have a little bit different take on these. In the enterprise, it could be simulation, like I talked about, a lot of digital twins starting to happen, and engineering and design and so forth in a shared immersive environment. All the engineers in a shared immersive metaverse space working on an aircraft engine or, or whatever it is. And for the consumer, it could be a retail experience, as I described, or competition, which is code for gaming. Lots of different opportunities, so we're learning about Technology innovation with the metaverse, but also what is the business strategy? And that's profound and significant, and that's the substance that I was talking about. So what about transfer, transportation, mobility, automotive? Now, if you were with us for CES 2022, then you got to experience the shiny brand new West Hall, which is pictured here. And it's still very, very new, and it definitely is still super cool and cavernous, but this is where you'll find all those transportation uh, exhibits. And under that roof, we're going to see really three key technology themes. And the first one is this, is, is of course we're going to see more electric vehicles, but as equally important is how the electrification ecosystem is evolving. Now what does that mean? Well, what I'm talking about is advancements in battery chemistry, battery design, also charging systems. How are these things coming forward? Because having more electric vehicles is one thing, and that's how we grow the market, more EVs, more price points, different shapes and sizes for different customers and consumers. But it's also equally important to see how battery technology, how is range getting, uh, how are we able to drive further on a charge, how, how what's happening with fast charging and so forth. So we'll get to see that. Second is really the advancement of autonomy. We've been talking for years and years about self-driving vehicles, haven't we? Now, we're starting to see autonomy really earnestly move beyond passenger vehicles. And I would put it the salient of that narrative are self-driving trucks. I talked earlier about a labor shortage. Not just a US thing, a global thing. We just can't hire enough skilled workers like truck drivers. And here in the States, according to the American Trucking Association, by the year 2030, we will have here again in the United States a shortage of 160,000 truck drivers. How are we going to close that gap? Technology has the answer. So self-driving trucks, 
Very important, we're delivering a lot of stuff online. We'll probably do even more in the metaverse, and so all this has got to get delivered somehow. Humans are the nice to have. Technology has the answer. We'll see it over at West Hall. And third is the transformation of the in-vehicle experience. And there's so much to unpack here. I need another slide, so let's go to the next one. And this is what I'm talking about. And just taking a look at this slide, you get what I mean when I say screenification. You get what I'm talking about when I say screenification. Yeah, incredible. So a lot more screens, the full breadth of the dash. It's like, yeah, I see your big screen in the center stack, and I raise you a whole, whole screen across the entire dash and more in the back. So we, we start to layer in 5G connectivity, B to X connectivity. Uh, really what I'm saying is the vehicle cabin is really a, a nexus for so many different technology trends. Uh, and they're, they're coalescing, and we have this convergence, this confluence of trends that are happening. We used to talk about entertainment a lot in, in the vehicle. Well, now, cars are becoming marketplaces. And not just for the passengers, but also the driver. We think about voice control. The old way is I order my latte from Starbucks on my app. They're working on it. I'm going to go pick it up. The new way is using voice control and services to order that latte wire. I could really use a latte. Hey, and order that while you're driving using voice control and it's waiting for you when you arrive. So the, the vehicle becoming a marketplace, but also another new trend, features as a service. Features that you've, you've heard about paying a subscription fee for your heated seats. Will that be the tip of the iceberg? I don't know, we're gonna find out. And maybe some of the vehicle OEMs here at CES 2023 will have something to say about that. But it's entirely possible as recurring revenue becomes increasingly important to industry players, not just in, say, the wireless industry, but also automotive, might the AM, FM radio that we all might have taken for granted by this time become a subscription service. If you want that, you have to pay a monthly fee. Again, I don't know, and I'm not saying it will, but features as a service is definitely an emerging trend we'll learn more about at CES 2023. So I said a lot there, but just to kind of encapsulate this, I mean, electrification, yes, but the point I want to make on this slide with electrification is not just land-based vehicles, but vehicles, you know, yes on land, but also in air with RISE and their elect personal electric VTOL, which they'll be giving demos of that outside of West Hall on the platinum lot, so you'll actually be able to see this thing fly, which is going to be really cool. And then, of course, Candela is here with their electric hydrofoil watercraft, which is also cool, and the coolness factor needs no explanation. I mean, that thing looks awesome, and it's, it's available for sale. But they're here, and you can check it out uh, at CES. And of course, sensor innovation of all kinds, optical sensors, certainly LiDAR. If you're an electrical engineer, then you know that a lot of this innovation centers around solid state architectures. And vehicle performance, different tier ones, uh, shape-changing body panels, potentially, and, and, and grills like the Meza Plus from, from Magna is another example. And to talk a lot about this, we've got not one, but two automotive and transportation focused keynotes, one from BMW, one from Stellantis. Definitely want to put these on your, your calendar, your diary uh, to check out because they're going to have a lot to say about the future mobility between these two mega brands in automotive. You know how sometimes in technology we marvel that science fiction has become reality? Well, I think that's certainly true. And I know this is an antiquated kind of example. Uh, I'm an old guy, I'm an old guy, but it is true. And if you think about all the, the sensors and capabilities in the modern smartwatch, even just from a health standpoint, and more if you think about other advanced systems, say from MedOne, which has basically the equivalent of a medical tricorder in a box, you kind of start to feel like Dr. McCoy a little bit, a little bit feel like Dr. McCoy, but as the Starship Enterprise, uh, Dr. McCoy doing his thing in the sick bay, what are we doing down here on Earth? Well, a lot of us are, are constructing home health hubs, and we know the story about telemedicine and telehealth during the season of the pandemic and the health crisis, all this, this massively exploded for very obvious reasons, but what's happening now in this space is that we're seeing more sensors and wearables and other diagnostic tools come in to augment that. So more interactive live data streams that can be captured by the physician on the other end. So not just a bunch of talk, but 
but actually a real data exchange, and that really levels up that level of care and of telehealth, and certainly we know that telehealth is instrumental in extending care. Not everybody can get into the doctor's office, certainly if they, if they live in remote areas. Maybe that's miles or at miles, kilometers and kilometers away. Therapeutic systems, Abbott is here as another example with a lot of advanced therapies using technology, pain management, also managing chronic disease. So this is, this is a great example of when we talk about tech making life better. If you're managing a chronic disease like diabetes and you can have a technology solution that makes it easier, you feel better all the time, you're healthier and you live a longer life, that needs no explanation. That's amazing to see. And, and uh, digital therapeutics in full force at CES this year. But it's not just about managing chronic disease or our business with our doctors. It's also about health of fitness, really. And it's part of the home health hub and all kinds of connected health equipment and so forth. And here's another recurring revenue subscription service in some cases, but it all adds up to this home health hub that we're starting to see, not just here in the States, but really around the world being formulated. And I can go on and on and on about innovation in health tech, but let me just focus very quickly on three areas that I've really alluded to, the on-demand network around telehealth, and these advanced sensors, combining for an elevated experience. One particular use case where this is phenomenal is in remote patient monitoring. The old way, after you had your operation or procedure, you were obliged to spend so many days in the hospital. Not anymore, potentially. You can, with, with technology and these, these on-demand networks and sensors, you can be monitored from the comfort of your home. And nobody wants to spend one minute longer than they have to in the hospital. Am I right? So, so this is a great example of, of tech innovation in a new frontier. Mental wellness is another. So stress, anxiety management, also monitoring depression. And I want to make an important point here. In this case, with mental wellness, technology is not a substitute for the advice of a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, physician, whatever, it's really meant as a tool for monitoring and help in between visits, in between visits, helping stay on track with that therapy from the counselor or psychologist as one example. So not a replacement, but really a tool to help and hopefully lead to a quicker recovery. In virtual reality, I alluded to, to therapeutic uses in, on the OVR slide. So this, no need to go into here, but there are all so many use cases tumbling out of, of VR as it relates to health. And now I'm laboring the point a little bit, but I know you guys like examples from the show floor, and here are three of them that you'll see. Essence Group for remote patient monitoring, Abbott I've talked about, their pain management, Proclaim Plus solution, and SK with their zero glasses. Ordinary looking glasses, but with sensors, they can predict epileptic seizures. So pretty important if you suffer, suffer from epilepsy getting a heads up that you might have a seizure coming on. And to talk about all this, another amazing keynote, this is why I like to highlight, because these are great ways to capture some amazing perspective and also talk a lot about technology. We have a, a, a panel, a, a tremendous group of doctors moderated by another doctor. So what I'm really saying is there's a lot of knowledge in medicine, but also tech. And it may say future of care in America, but I would, say, I would wager that that's a proxy for care around the world and probably will have something to do with telehealth as I described before. Sustainability in ESG is another trend that you're gonna see at the show, and I'm, this, this slide is intentionally, the, the graphic is, it's a very horizontal trend. Put another way, I think it's gonna be omnipresent at CES 2023. So we know there's been a rising dialogue around sustainability and ESG in all kinds of different places, all across the economy, every kind of different sector. Everybody's talking about this. And with tech alone, there's a lot underneath this umbrella of sustainability. Not time to talk about all of it, but I can talk about some of it, like clean air, uh, alternative power, and then also food and ag tech. Let's take a look at some of that. Some more examples from the show floor, including a couple of startups that uh, I know you guys love to document out there, that, that just the cradle of innovation from startups in the Park. Aqua Robotics has, and as you might be able to tell from the picture, a, a robot that, that swims inside water pipes to create a digital twin, but also to look for leaks. And the statistics I'll, uh, statistic I'll leave you with is that globally, about 30 billion cubic meters of clean water are lost due to leaks each and every year. That's a lot of clean water. We can do better, and solutions like this help. The Jackery is your personal power windmill 
pretty cool if you're, let's say you're at the beach and you know it's like someone has their solar array here, you come with your, your solar power, your, sorry, your, your wind power windmill. So alternative power sources, really cool. And I talked a little bit about battery technology in the automotive chapter, but Leyden Jar has a new take on battery technology. If you're familiar, batteries have anodes and cathodes, positive and negative. And up until now, they use graphite, which is pretty harmful for the environment if it's not disposed of correctly, which often, I'm, I'm sad to say, is not. Using silicon is very neutral for the environment, and you have only to look at your nearest beach to find a, a lot of silicon around. So it's not a rare earth mineral or anything like that by any stretch. But what about ag tech? Well, I talked about this new phase of automation and virtualization that's starting to manifest really across across the economy, and, and I've talked a good bit about that, but this slide really documents what I think we can expect in terms of agriculture. So what you're looking at here is essentially the fully automated farm with 5G connectivity. We have sensors in the soil, in the sky, with drones doing spectrographic analysis. We have intelligent connected silos with predictive analytics that are estimating just exactly how much grain or whatever it is that we're gonna harvest. We have autonomous systems in the field doing the tilling, the harvesting. A lot of that data is computed at the edge, but even more is computed uh, off-site in the cloud, and a lot of the insights are downloaded right to the farmer where he or she gets a whole new perspective on how much fertilizer they need to order. Maybe they can commit to a futures price and get a jump on their competitors, but also really optimize food production, and that's really what we're talking about here. But I'm not just gonna talk about this. Actually, John Deere is. In their keynote, we have John May, the CEO of John Deere, here at CES. And this, on the screen, is their new installation, the autonomous tractor. If you look closely, there's, there's, there's no farmer in there. There's no farmer. It's driving itself. And so again, how will technology help feed a growing world? We have more and more mouths to feed, so we desperately need technology innovation to help us. And John Deere will have some great examples of that. Okay, last chapter on gaming and services. And in this chapter, I want to feature some of our amazing research that we do each and every year at Consumer Technology Association. A lot of it focused on the U.S. market, as we, we are the North American Trade Association for Consumer uh, Technology. But in any case, I'll be featuring some data from our very, very recent Future of Gaming study that was actually a refresh of, of work that we did in 2019. Very interesting comparisons. And importantly, for, for you as media, we're releasing today our updated industry forecast. And so I'll be featuring some, some services forecast data uh, in this chapter. But to come back to gaming for a moment, one of the key insights, of course, we know gaming is very important to the industry, but it's also important to culture. It's become very important to culture. Let me show you what I'm talking about and some of the, the evidence to document what I was talking about. According to our 2022 Future of Gaming study, now this was released just last fall, just a few months ago, the U.S. market today has 164 million self-described gamers. And by the way, I know this is U.S. data, but trends are global these days, and I think this is a good proxy for, for more global trends. But that's a very big number, ages 13 to 64. In fact, if you look at the U.S. general population across that age cohort, the gamer segment represents nearly three quarters of the general population between 13 and, and, and 64. So a big number, but an even more surprising and another big number is how much time people are spending gaming these days. Back in 2019, uh, our research found that the average gamer in the US spent 16 hours a week playing games. Pretty big number. What is it today? Today, it's a full day, 24 hours. 24 hours on average per week spent gaming. Now, how could that be possible? Well, take a look closer. A lot of gamers in the U.S. describe themselves as a casual gamer, but also as a mobile gamer. They, they confess that they're a mobile gamer. Uh, but but uh, I don't know about you, but on the plane, I saw several people around me in my vicinity, pretty much the entire five-hour flight from Washington, D.C. to Las Vegas, they were playing some kind of a game. So it's all these little in-between moments that we spend gaming. It adds up to a lot of time, not just hardcore gamers, you know, staying up into the wee hours of the night or the morning playing games, it's a lot of us. So, really interesting, 
But why are people spending so much time gaming these days? And this was another profound takeaway from our research. And it's this, is that we found that consumers are, are still playing games for the age-old reason of entertainment, escapism, some competition, if you like Fortnite, <laughs> as one example. But increasingly, it's about connection and socialization. So what I'm saying is, the game is really a construct or a medium for socialization. And I myself, guilty as charged. You know, I connect with my friends online, and yeah, we're playing a game, but we're also talking about what's been going on, we'll plan to get the next happy hour or something like that. It, it's, a, it's a construct in many ways for socialization. And I think when we think about metaverse and those immersive experiences, that will only grow and increase. But what about at CES, to kind of pull this back now for gaming at CES, and once again, a lot of innovation is gonna empower connections, whether it's hardware, cool new displays and monitors, haptic systems, deepening immersion for these experiences. And yes, I'm hopeful that we'll hear more from Sony about their, their PlayStation VR 2 headset. They talked about that at CES 2022, but hopefully they will again and they'll give us more details. So, and, and by the way, the gamer cohort or audience or segment is, is pretty much purpose built for these shared immersive experiences. And that's, that's another key finding from our research. But what about services? Okay, well we know certainly coming out of the pandemic that services have become very important to consumers. And in fact, a lot of consumers adopted a whole bunch of new services during the season of the pandemic, like ordering groceries online. And the key takeaway is, is that consumers, not just in the US, but around the world, are sticking with those. So we've seen really a transmutation, a uh, modulation of consumer behavior, really emphasizing the services. And to provide more evidence, I, I mentioned our, our brand new forecast that we're releasing. You can get a copy of the press release tonight. 30, here in the US market, 31 cents of every tech dollar is attributable to service spending. That's a big percentage, and it's only gonna grow and increase. Because I think more and more, it's more about services and the things that we're doing with tech and less about the hardware itself. Less about the hardware itself and more what we're doing with tech, which is why we're seeing more competition in the services space, across cloud gaming, fitness, so many different aspects. And also new business models. I think the whole ad-supported video streaming business model has, has gained a lot of news and commentary and helps uh, extend those services to, to households and maybe reduce churn in some cases. But really services today underpinning today's modern uh, digital lifestyle. And to close out this chapter, again, this is from our, our recent forecast update. You can very clearly see the ramp, at least here in the US market, of services spending. And this was, again, a function of the season of the pandemic where we really transmuted consumer behavior. It's more about services today. Services being very important. And although we've kind of leveled out here, most of this ties to the current economic environment and inflation, paying more for everything. Consumers are taking a little bit harder look at their services portfolio, if you like. I think, though, once we, we get through this economic downturn, we'll start to see that services sector start to grow again, and we'll probably see a whole slew of new services here at CES 2023. Okay, well, that concludes my remarks. Unveil is next. We've talked about a lot of trends tonight here at, in this ballroom. There's even more innovation and innovation waiting for you, and even more beyond that on the show floor of, of CES 2023. Much success at the show. Thank you.